Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Frank James, the president of Missio Seminary here in Philadelphia. Our topic in this webinar is the meaning of missional. Now, many of you know that the term missional has been bandied out for some time now, and it has come to mean different things for different people. Uh, but this term missional goes to the very heart of who we are at missional Semin at Missio Seminary. It's our DNA. Uh, it's the reason we changed our name to Missio Seminary. It's the reason we moved to the city. Uh, so it really is a guiding star for us on the board, on the faculty. Uh, it really is who we are. Now this year, 2021, uh, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary, 1971 to 2021. And one of the things that I really appreciate about our seminary is that we continue to grow in our understanding of scripture. Uh, we continue to grow how we think about the way we live and about how we do seminary. Uh, that is part of our missional commitment to continue to learn, to listen, and to grow. That's really an important part of, of who we are. So we will be having a series of these webinars uh, as we celebrate our 50th anniversary. We'll be doing this for the next 12 to 18 months with these regular webinars, talking about some aspect of the seminary and how we serve the community of Philadelphia. It's been almost 20 years when Biblical Seminary, as it was then known, took the missional turn and embraced our missional identity. And so this first webinar really centers on the missional identity. Uh, we will explore and illumine, hopefully, this missional idea from three perspectives. We will look at scripture, because we do believe it is a biblical scriptural notion. We'll do some theological reflection about what this means, and then we'll enter into some of the challenges that we face in this world uh, and how we need to be a missional a seminary and a missional church. So our panelists for this webinar are three of my colleagues and even more three of my friends. Professors Todd Mangum, Steve Taylor, and Q Bom Lee. Uh, Todd Mangum is the Clemens Professor of Missional Theology. He's not only the longest serving faculty member, but he has been a part of the history of Missio Seminary since from nearly the beginning. His mother began to work at the seminary in 1975, just four years after its founding. And so he's got lots of stories about the early days and the early faculty. Secondly is Steve Taylor. He is the Taylor Professor of New Testament. Uh, Steve was, uh, uh, was, is the son of missionaries and he grew up in Brazil. He's kind of bicultural. And by the way, he makes the most delicious Brazilian cheese biscuits I've ever had. Our third panelist is Kubam Lee, professor of missiology and director of our DMN program. He too is the son of missionaries. He was born in South Korea, grew up in Kenya where his parents were missionaries, and then since his college days, he's been in the U.S. and has become a U.S. citizen. Uh, Cubom uh, is one of the few people I've ever met who is tri-cultural. Uh, I don't know how he keeps everything uh, figured out in his head, but he truly is an amazing individual with all of his experiences. Our plan in this webinar is for each panelist to give a short presentation from their area of expertise. So uh, Professor Lee will describe the unique challenges facing the church nationally and globally, and talk about the urgent need for a missional church to be rooted in the mission of God. Professor Taylor will look at the Bible 
as a product of and an instrument of God's mission. And Professor Mangum will help us understand how the missional conversation is rooted in deep theological reflection, especially the doctrine of the Trinity. So our goal is to have a lively conversation. I'm sure there'll be interaction back and forth. Uh, and so to kick things off, I'd like to begin with a little bit of history before we really get into the questions. And so I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dr. Todd Mangum. It is hard for me to believe, it's nearly impossible for me to believe that uh, I guess I'm the last one left at Missio that actually knew Alan McRae and Jack Murray. And uh, I, I did know them. I, I was at dinner with them. Now, you know, don't, don't get the wrong idea. Uh, I was in junior high school when my mother came to work uh, for the seminary. I was seventh, eighth grader. So uh, it, we were at meals. We, uh, we had dinner with the uh, McCrae's. We had dinner with uh, Jack and Eleanor uh, Murray. Uh, I didn't listen as closely as I wish I had or should have at some of those uh, meals. But I, I heard the stories of the founding of the seminary. And then, of course, when I came as a student and when I was working on my doctoral program, I'll tell you about that in a, in a minute. I got uh, some interviews, some more serious conversations with uh, particularly Dr. McRae. But, but here's the main observation I would make in regard to the founding of Biblical Seminary and what we have become now as Missio Seminary. Every move that we have made can be seen in hindsight as an outgrowth of the original trajectory set in motion by Biblical Seminary's original vision. Now, don't overread that or don't mishear that. I'm not saying we're doing the exact same thing that they did. Uh, I'd like to think that they would approve of the moves we've made. I, I, don't, I don't really know. But what I'm saying is the, the path that they set in motion, the, the DNA uh, out of which grew the, the missional trajectory was really set in motion by that uh, original vision. And I'm, I'd like to ferret that out a little bit. We've often observed that the, the two founders, Alan McRae, Dr. Alan McRae, Princeton-trained uh, Bible scholar, conjoined with, partnered with Jack Murray, passionate, effective evangelist. And those two together that whole was greater than the sum of the parts. And now go, let's go a step deeper in that. Dr. McRae, he was a scholar, Bible-believing scholar for sure, trained Old Testament scholar, uh, definitely trained and definitely concerned about uh, fending off the, the inroads of anti-supernaturalism and, and particularly um, uh, more... Uh, liberal, higher critical approaches to the Old Testament. I mean, that, that was part of what he was about. But he was also an explorer. I mean, what, one of the stories that uh, we were regaled by and with in, in the early days was hearing how on his honeymoon, he and Grace McRae are on their honeymoon, and he's called to help rescue uh, some, and I don't remember anymore whether it was hikers that got lost or a small craft went down in the Grand Canyon, but he was called from his honeymoon to help find these people lost in the Grand Canyon. Why? Because he was a hiker. He was an explorer. He was a, a mountain climber. Now, not a rock climber like that, but he, he hiked, he explored. That was part of, of who he was. He viewed the world with curiosity. And into his 90s, he explored and engaged the scripture with wonder. You know, not, not, not as a set of tight fit answers just to be defended. He had a wonder, a curiosity about his biblical scholarship that formed part of the original DNA of the school. Jack Murray was an, he, he was an evangelist, passionate about evangelism, but he was an innovator. 
He was an experimenter. So, you know, you put those two things together and that formed the original DNA, uh, the original context that we've built upon uh, ever since. So today we still have that, that uh, embrace and value of biblical scholarship and, and theological uh, thinking. We have Ivy League trained biblical scholars like Steve Taylor, Oxford trained scholars like Dave Lamb, who are, who are teaching uh, the Bible. We still have that. And likewise, we still have a, a, an embrace and a value of innovation and experimentation, kind of like Jack Murray. You know, I don't know about Frank James level of innovation on steroids, but, but innovation, experimentation. Uh, a couple of faculty meetings ago, uh, our new faculty member, Clarence Wright, was talking about he uses social media and multimedia uh, avenues for kingdom engagement because he, he says, you know, if, if Jesus were in bodily form present today, Jesus would use Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. And, um, and I'm fast going to no longer know what I'm literally talking about. But Clarence does. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, he sounds like Jack Murray. Now, I know Clarence never even knew Jack Murray, but that was in our original DNA that really has propelled uh, the, the kind of uh, missional trajectory uh, that we've been on. I remember, and I think I, this was in the seventh, eighth grade uh, era, I think I was visiting my mother at work, and I saw one of the original one of the banners uh, that uh, the marketing and admissions team was using at the time, such such as it was. And and get this, and this was a campaign launched by Dave McCarty. Uh, people who were here back then will remember Dave McCarty, you know. Uh, but he had a banner, an ad campaign that that said this, and this is you know in the early seventies. Come to Biblical Theological Seminary, a new seminary that's radically different. Now, I, I saw that banner, and then I saw in the background there was, a, there was another banner, or maybe the other banner was up front. Come to Biblical Seminary, a new seminary that's surprisingly different. And I remember inquiring about it from Dave McCarty, and I think Dave Watkins was in there. You know, some of these, these people whose, whose names we dare not forget, but have long been forgotten in many cases. But uh, Dave McCarty said, yeah, you know, uh, uh, you know, a new seminary that's radically different. Not everyone liked, you know, liked the way that's, that's put. And I can just hear, I can just hear Doc Newman, uh, what his response would have been to that. <clears throat> radical, radically different. I, I don't know if we're trying to be radical. <laughs> it's, trying to be, it's trying to be faithful to the Lord, you know. Um, so, and uh, there was a humility about, uh, you know, the founders that, that just kind of bristled that, you know, anything that could sound audacious. But Dave McCarty was not off when he said, this is a new seminary that's not just trying to preserve and retain or hold on to. This is a seminary that started to do something different. That's uh, something unique something distinctive. We've always been an interdenominational school. That's not just by happenstance. That's not just by accident or, or, or coincidence. The founders of biblical seminary to a person were tired of all the infighting. To a person, part of their passion for starting this new school was rooted in their deep grief that Bible-believing Christians engaged in so much internecine combat and destructiveness of one another. So they started a new school in part to overcome the splintering, the, uh, the, uh, the, the unnecessary and inappropriate dogmatisms that led to uh, you know, undermining uh, that. So uh, I, I remember my last interview with Dr. McCray, 
uh, when I was working on uh, my, my uh, doctoral program. I wasn't even, you know, at Missio. I was interviewing him. The last question I, that I asked him was, you know, any closing comments? I, at that time, I was exploring the debate between dispensationalism and covenant theology. And he knew a lot about that and all that. But I said, any last words? And he was forthright. His, his words rang in my ear to this day. He said, Todd, just remember this. All of these other debates, all th these are minor these are, these are minor and can be distractions to the main purpose and the main goal of embracing Christ and pursuing and focusing on the things of Christ. So whatever you do, whatever you do with these other debates and whatnot, remember to focus on the things of Christ, and the purposes of Jesus Christ. Now, he didn't say generous orthodoxy. He didn't use the terminology of Christotelic. He, he didn't have the language of missional. But what he was getting at and the, and the root vision of McRae-Murray together was in pursuit of majoring on the majors, not teaching what to think, but how to think, taking the scripture seriously. And then what's happened since then is as we've taken the scripture seriously, sought to major on the things of Christ and the purposes of Christ, we've seen that the God of the Bible is a God of mission, is a missional God. The purposes of Christ are kingdom purposes of, of mission that embraces an interdenominational diversity in which we can join together in the mission of God through Christ. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate that that sort of overview of the seminary gives you, it speaks to the heart of our founders and that we are very much in accord with that. Let me turn to Q. Uh, uh, missional theology arose in part from missiologists, people like uh, Leslie Newbegin uh, or uh, David Bosch. Uh, and, and, but it's true that missiology hasn't always been seen as, as vital for the preparation of Christian ministry. Here's my question to you. Why should Christian leaders in the United States pay attention to missiology and missional theology? Thank you, Frank. Um, yeah, missiology, which is my field, um, it deals with, with culture. Um, and it um, originally arose because missionaries saw a need to understand cross-cultural work, but traditionally it wasn't, as you has, have mentioned, it wasn't really seen as needed back home, you know, in the, back in the Christian West. Um, now, you know, when a culture stays the same or it works uh, more or less for the church to kind of ignore culture change because it doesn't affect your day-to-day, you know, the church can operate for a while as though culture doesn't matter. That's how the Western church operated um, in, you could say for centuries, uh, cocooned as it were in Western Christendom. You, you might have to deal with culture if you go over there, right? Where we send missionaries, but uh, not over here where it's already Christian. Uh, but when a culture changes and it has changed dramatically in myriad ways in the West, uh, the church is forced to deal with the reality of culture. Otherwise, it ends up uh, sticking its head in the sand. In the process, we started to, we started to see something fundamental about the gospel. When it, uh, the church deals with reality, it starts to see that uh, the gospel is intercultural, that it's, it always seeks to be translated into new cultures, that the mission is always ongoing and fresh and new. And so Leslie Newbegin was a missionary in India before returning to the West. And he was a leader with the kind of cross-cultural experience that enabled him to conclude the West is a mission field just as much as India is. And this wasn't just because secularism was on the rise in the West and the church needed to retake the West from, the, from secularism. There was a recognition um, that the church has always been missionary in its very nature that it had always been a people sent by God to God's world on God's mission. And uh, spending time in other cultures helped pe people like Newbegin and others to see this basic truth that the church in the West had forgotten. 
So today, when the culture in the West is undergoing tremendous and rapid change, it's easy for the church in the West to react out of fear and out of nostalgia. Uh, but a missional understanding of the church says the church has been built for intercultural mission. The gospel was always meant to be transmitted across cultures. It's uh, always at home in many diverse people groups all around the globe because Christians have always believed that Jesus was Lord of all nations. So when the church reclaims this identity that's rightfully theirs, the church can live in the midst of this rapidly, tremendously changing culture without fear, but creatively and hopefully and faithfully live on mission. Uh, and I think that's why it's so important for the church, church's theology to be shaped by missiology and by its understanding of its missionary nature. And this has always been so, but I think it's all too clear now. Oh, Q, I, I, you know, I, I really appreciate that. You know, uh, uh, I think a number of us have, have lived abroad. Uh, you <laughs> spent most of your life living in different cultures and Steve, uh, and I lived for four years in England. Even though we spoke the same language, we were divided by culture. And when you have to live in a different culture, you start to see and hear things uh, that maybe you didn't know about yourself even. So that has been transformative in my own experience. And I think anyone who has lived abroad, any spent any time in a different culture, uh, it is very, very illuminating. So thank you for that. Uh, Steve, uh, when the seminary changed its name from Biblical Seminary uh, to Missio Seminary, uh, some folks wondered whether or not we were minimizing the Bible. If we were, you know, and, and certainly the answer to that is no, of course not. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about uh, the Bible and its relation uh, to the mission of God? Well, um, the yeah, what's becoming clear about the Bible is that as we read it honestly, and, and oftentimes with the help of uh, scholarship that uh, we would might consider not God or Bible honoring, but with their help, with their uh, insights, uh, with the insights of, of, of Jewish scholars uh, that I studied alongside uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, learned a lot from. We're, we're finding out that, that the, the, the Bible is, uh, it's very structure, uh, is uh, uh, ultimately missional because it's given in bits and pieces through time as a result of God's working with folk in time, in culture. Uh, so that the, this, our God is this God who uh, has uh, appreciated culture has crossed lines uh, over and over again uh, in order to uh, reveal his heart uh, and through, through a process and we'll say much more about that uh, uh, later but but certainly the the the, the Bible is uh, is by no means uh, put to one side when we take up a missional focus uh, the Bible actually sharpens that focus and, and basically says, of course, of course, this was true all along. You should have seen it earlier. Uh, and that's, that certainly was my own experience as I uh, walked through these, these years at, at uh, Missio Seminary. Steve, one of the things uh, that, that uh, I think is important, and I've heard you talk about this a little bit before, uh, when you talk about the biblical view of, of God's mission, one of the things you talk about is God's love. And I, I'm, I'm struck by that, uh, that, that that is such a central, vital piece of a biblical view of God's mission. Could, could you say a, a, a word or two about, about, about God's love? Well, now you're going to get me on a, in a pulpit and I'm likely to <laughs> keep okay. preaching. That's okay. Yeah, but uh, one of the things I think that'll come out uh, when, as, as we address uh, the, this big topic from, from the perspective of different disciplines and when Todd speaks, et cetera, is that uh, the, the, the Christian understanding of God ultimately framed by God's self-revelation in his son 
reflection on all that Trinitarian theology is that uh, God is this community of love. I'm not going to try to steal uh, Todd's thunder about that. Uh, so we, we can already say in, in the preliminary way that this loving community that God is, is at the springboard of all this. But uh, on the other end, uh, in this long process of God's self-revelation, uh, we, we come to this climactic revelation of himself that uh, happens in the person of his son, uh, in, the, in what we might call the Christ event, incarnation, but then especially the cross, God's self-giving. Uh, and then, of course, the gift of the Spirit, a, a God's embrace of us uh, in, in ways that are surprising given other elements of the story. So it's, it's uh, quite, um, it's, Given the story, John's conclusion in 1 John chapter 4 that he actually articulates uh, twice, right, is that God is love, uh, which is an amazing statement. Uh, uh, you know, two nouns connected by the verb to be, not a noun connected by the verb to be to, a, to a, an adjective, but God is love, right? So uh, if that's true, then in some sense, uh, we have to as we act in the world and as we reflect on our, on our doctrine, we have to, uh, in some sense, uh, say over and over again to ourselves, God is doing this because he's love. Even the wrath of God, God is wrathful in this situation because he is love, not because somehow love has been pushed aside by some other rising emotion but uh, because God is love in some way. And how that's worked out, it's a lot of mystery there. But yeah, that's why I, I keep stressing the love of God as the ultimate revelation of God, the unifying revelation of God's character. God's uh, love, his, 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 his essence, uh, is connected to the great commandment to, to love God back and to love our neighbor. And so the implications of who God is, his love, it's an extraordinary, powerful, uh, uh, has, has strong, powerful implications for how we live and how we interact with God and how we interact with one another. I, I can't stress that enough, uh, particularly as Todd mentioned, you know, in the founding of the seminary, there was all this strife and, and fighting about, you know, what, what Dr. McCray considered minor uh, sort of differences. Uh, to, to acknowledge God's love is, is actually a, a critical element in, in our theological system. Uh, let, me, let me turn to Todd. Uh, uh, Todd, uh, what difference does it make? Uh, does being missional make in teaching and learning of theology? And then if you have you know, thoughts about how our curriculum is different uh, because we've adopted a missional approach. Yeah. In five minutes or less, right? You know, <laughs> uh, let me let me give it a go. You know, what difference does it make uh, to understand that God is missional in his being and in, in, in his character, much less to take a missional approach to theology, missional approach uh, to ministry? Uh, I, I will tell you this. Uh, we did not embark on a missional approach to theology, biblical studies, and ministry out of just purely pragmatic marketing concerns. Uh, we, beca we became convinced as a faculty that Scripture presents us with a God who is missional in his very being and his very character. Now, I got to I got to say what that means. You know, what are those just pretty words or does that really mean something? What does it mean that God is missional? Well, missional, just linguistically, etymologically, comes from a Latin word that means sends, God sends. Mito, mitere, uh, that's the verb part. You actually build the noun forms, nominalize it from the third principal part, missy, fourth, missus, missa, missum. But missy becomes in the noun form, missio, missionis. And that's where we get, obviously, the English word and the concept of God being missional. God is a God who sends, and that is God is a God who shares. God is a God that intrinsically extends himself. So what difference does it make? 
every curriculum and every seminary, every Bible college in the world affirms the Trinity. We'll have a section, have courses on the Trinity. Well, what difference does understanding God as missional make to the Trinity? Well, if we understand that God is missional, we understand that in his very being, God is three, God is one. Uh, if you're not careful, that can become nothing more than a philosophical puzzle to, to try to solve. And traditional systematic theology can kind of you know, convert it into a kind of philosophical puzzle, or maybe at, at best an area of uh, mystical contemplation. Uh, but understanding that God is missional in his very character says God in his being is a community of persons in loving fellowship with one another. So that when God creates, God creates not out of some sort of deficiency or some set of need. God creates because it's in his very nature to not just hoard it to himself. It's like he intrinsically wants to share, desires to extend, expand. So he creates. And as he creates, he extends himself in such a way that the multifaceted beauty, the aesthetic tastes of God are, are manifest. So God creates a body of water, but he creates a body of water, not just to, to sit there, stagnate a, a, as water. Before you know it, it it's teeming with life. Uh, reproducing life, you know, just, ju just teeming. Psalm 104 tells us that God created the ocean in part because he knew that this would get, be a great place for the whales and the dolphins to have fun in, to frolic in. Nobody even sees them well, other than God, of course, but, but that's just it. God's character is such that he enjoys it when his creation is just having fun and joy. And, and think about the coral reefs and the multicolored fish at, at 200 feet down. Nobody ever seen. I mean, every once in a while you get a Jacques Cousteau that goes down with a camera and, and you see this brilliant set of colors. Why would he do that? Stick it in the bottom of the... Because God is by his very nature, one that shares and creatively expands. And you look at what happens to the doctrine of the Trinity or the dogma of the Trinity without a missional understanding, it, it almost becomes just the opposite <laughs> of what it is. It, be, it, it becomes this narrow philosophical corpus that well, you can't say that. You, you can't say, oh, wait a minute. That sounds like modalism. Hey, yeah, that sounds like Eutychianism, Apollinarian. Not that, not that, not that, not that. But the missional character of God understood in the Trinity is just the reverse of that kind of uh, parsimonious, narrow kind of garden. It's, it's expansive. And then, of course, God creates human beings. And these human beings fall. Now let's, let's be clear. That, that taking of the fruit in the garden, that was not just an innocuous mistake. Told you not to eat the cookie, now you ate the cookie. No, no. That was an act intended to be a subversive challenge to the creative prerogatives of God and, and actu actually in pursuit of trying to compete him, compete with him. As, as rival regents rather than created co-regents. Now, if God were merely just and righteous, which of course he is, but if he were merely just and righteous, well, you just squash him, start over, you know, for, uh, for people that, you know, cre create new creatures that are better at, uh, at obeying him. If he were merely loving, or maybe the way of saying it, if his love were just a kind of sentimental, tame love, maybe that's the way, way of saying it. Well, then he might have slapped them on the wrist, you know, naughty, naughty, give him a nuggy. I, I, I wish you hadn't done that. Uh, you know, try to do better in the future. But God's character is such that 
in his righteousness and his love, he takes up a self-sacrificial redemptive mission. And the rest of the story of uh, the scripture, the narrative of scripture and the trajectory of scripture uh, uh, unfolds from there. And his mission is such that uh, not only does he offer uh, the recipients of that mission and recipients of that grace the benefits of forgiveness, though, though that's there too, but it's not just a, a, a gospel to benefit from. He actually calls the recipients to join in, invites, nay, requires, expects to join in that redemptive mission. There's more to say about that, but I don't know how long I've gone, and I'll pause at least. ask all of you this question uh, and, and, and brief answers if you can, but this missional perspective that we're, we're talking about that's so important to our seminary, how does this impact how we understand the gospel itself? You know, we tend to think of the gospel as uh, sort of uh, more personal. So let, let me let me ask uh, Steve uh, to, to kick us off, and then Todd, and then Q. If you just if you have any comments, just just give us a sense of what we think, well, how we think of the gospel. Well, uh, I uh, I'm I'm conscious of, and I know my brothers here well enough to realize that they've got some things to say, and I don't want to tread on uh, in their space. So let me uh, let me put it in, in uh, terms that are more closely tied to the Bible. The, the gospel is, is nothing short of uh, the, the proclamation that uh, God has uh, broken through and made the crucial turning point in putting his mission back on track, right? So the mission originally was, I'm gonna create this, uh, make this creation full of beauty, uh, enjoyment. I'm gonna create image bearers people that bear my image that can uh, receive, uh, appreciate, uh, savor, reflect back and extend the loving community of, uh, of the Trinity, right? That's, that's the original mission. That's still his mission. Uh, of course, as Todd mentioned, it got uh, fouled off, uh, fouled up and, and, and waylaid uh, and the, the whole phase of what we might call redemption. Uh, the gospel is the announcement that God has broken through and uh, the, the mission is back on track. And in fact, in one sense, it's already been a, achieved in principle in the one man, Jesus Christ, who is now king. And, and so we go out proclaiming the kingdom of God, the rule of God through this king. It's not just a, a, a one-off story about how each one of us gets individually to heaven. It's the climax of this vast story, the story, the big story of the universe itself, uh, which we've now been, been called into. Uh, and that's what the, how the Bible teaches us to see uh, the coming of Jesus and the meaning of the cross as, as a God's uh, a suffering embrace of, of a, a world gone wrong, uh, et cetera. So I'll, I'll stop there and I, I'm sure my, my brothers yeah. will fill that on out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Todd, any, any thoughts about how, how, how do we talk about the gospel at at Missio Seminary? Yeah, ab absolutely. And of course, there's another question. There's a lot to say. Uh, it, there are some self-described missional thinkers and missional ministers that say the gospel, our understanding of the gospel is the same as it's always been. Missional just allows us to be more innovative, uh, more uh, intelligent, more savvy in, in how we spread it. Uh, I've, I've come to believe myself, and we as a faculty at, at Missio Seminary, uh, I think have come to agreement that, that actually a missio, missio under, uh, missional understanding affects even our understanding of the gospel itself. Now, I, I want to clarify, that doesn't mean that no one up to now has, you know, gotten it right enough to get to know God. You know, it's been a, been a false gospel up, up to now. I'm not saying that. Uh, you know, lot, lots of people have come to know Christ and know him authentically and fully through uh, what, uh, even through what uh, Daryl Guder calls 
uh, a reductionist understanding of the gospel. So what needs uh, correction? I, I'd put it this way, that a, a traditional evangelical understanding of the gospel can be so focused on the forgiveness that the atonement bought that it can overlook almost entirely the self-sacrificial take up your cross and follow me message that Jesus taught, much less participate in the kingdom mission that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection brought. So you catch that? So focused on the forgiveness, the atonement bought. That ignored is what Jesus taught, much less the kingdom that his kingdom that his life, death, resurrection brought. Dallas Willard puts it this way: Jesus didn't die on the cross, just so you and I didn't need to die on the cross. Now, be clear: only Jesus' cross work brings substitutionary atonement. So, um, don't get carried away. Don't mishear me. But Jesus didn't die on the cross just so you and I wouldn't have to die on the cross. He died on the cross so that you and I might join him in his death on the cross. That's why Jesus' message is, uh, you want to be a disciple of mine? You must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Uh, Hebrews 12 talks about setting our eyes on Jesus run the race set before us. See, that's different from uh, a, 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 an understanding of uh, the gospel being, and I'm caricaturing here, okay? I'm not trying to cite any anyone, but it's different from, just by way of sharp contrast. Uh, Hebrews 12 is not saying, uh, set your eyes on Jesus as you sit on your tushy in the bleachers, applauding the race that Jesus ran. Good job, Jesus. How wonderful that you... It is keeping your eyes on Jesus to run the race set before each one of us. Now, be clear, Todd Mangum, I myself can do nothing apart from Christ. But with Christ, through Christ, uh, I can do more. In fact, I think there's a verse somewhere that says I can do all things. You know, without Christ, nothing is possible. Yeah, our, our mission at Missio Seminary is futile. But through Christ, nothing is impossible. Uh, now, run the race. It, it, it's my legs, my lungs, and, and whatnot that are running the race. But it's through Christ, by Christ in me. That strikes me as a more robust understanding and embrace of the gospel than at least I understood. Maybe I'm the only one. That, but that I understood growing up. Yeah. Q, uh, you know, one of the things I want to, I want to combine is, uh, you know, Mr. Seminary made the decision to move to the city of Philadelphia uh, about a year, year and a half ago. Uh, and so I want to ask you, uh, one, why was this a missional decision? And how is this an expression of the gospel? What's the connection with the gospel as we understand it, and the move to Philadelphia. So I'm giving you sort of a two two sided question there. Yeah, um, I, I think um, well to to uh, follow up on um, uh, our understanding of the gospel um, question. Um, I think another way to think about this has been um, think about the thinking about the gospel in terms of uh, in its holistic nature. Uh, so uh, missiologists have uh, begin, been really been uh, learning more and more, I think, in their work uh, that the gospel actually, uh, it doesn't, it's not only individual, it's not only personal uh, reconciliation with God, but actually there's a, there's a, there's a holistic dimension uh, to this. Um, and I think um, probably capturing that the best in in some would be when Jesus in Revelation when at the end of all things uh, he says I am making all things new um, and uh, I think we do need to reclaim the gospel is good news 
uh, as far as the curse is found. And therefore the curse will be driven out wherever they may be, not just only in our relationship with God, but in our relationship with ourselves, uh, in our relationship with one another, uh, in society, between races, uh, between the rich and poor, between man and woman, uh, uh, with where, wherever there's brokenness, and then even further to our environment, uh, to creation, um, to, and in all of these things, Jesus is making all things new. Um, and uh, as uh, gospel proclaimers, we are, uh, we are to proclaim Jesus is Lord over all. Um, and uh, including, I think, many places that uh, Christians have fled out from, uh, thinking that, well, that's done and that's going, that's uh, all uh, spoiled by sin or by brokenness and uh, there's no hope for that anymore. Uh, all we have to do is to have our personal relationship with God and have our forgiveness and our fire insurance so that we might uh, go be with heaven uh, when, we, when we die. Uh, or when all things burn up. And I think a city has been viewed uh, in many ways uh, by the American church for a long time in that way. Um, I, I think um, it would be fair to say that the American church, at least the majority culture church, uh, largely participated in the white flight out of the city in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and I think uh, some of that has to do with our anti-urban bias and some of that has to do with our theology that was not missional. Um, and uh, in the process, whether they consciously thought this or not, the church effectively fled from other races and other ethnicities that were in the city and were newly arriving into the city. And uh, they were thereby, in my estimation, abandoning their mission. Uh, but the city, um, as we are informed by scriptures and as we look at um, uh, what the city is actually about, it, it is the very embodiment of the massive culture change that's been taking place in our world. Um, and uh, the, the culture has been shifting from Christendom to post-Christendom, from homogeneity to a plurality of ethnicity, socioeconomic classes, ideas, religions, cultures, and um, you know, these, and the, the church had a, a, a stance towards this massive culture change with, as with, a, 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 with suspicion, with fear, something to abhor. And, uh, but, but, you know, when there's such massive cultural changes taking place, and I believe that this is an action of God. Um, but if you can, if you're the, the church, you can only run from that for so long before it catches up to you. So... <clears throat> If we take on, take on a missional perspective, um, I think we can see the city not as a danger to run from or an enemy territory, right? That uh, we send commandos to, to be retaken by Christians by force, uh, but it's actually a good gift from God. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's the context in which we are to live and, and uh, find our, uh, our uh, flour own flourishing and also the flourishing of the nations. Um, you know, that where, where God has much good intentions in store uh, for us. Uh, for, I think for one, uh, the, the city is where the, 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 the church can have an opportunity to become its more, more truly itself. Because the city is where opportunities to live on God's mission are abounding and opening up in ever unexpected ways. Uh, so there are so many things to say about the city, uh, and because I'm an neurophysiologist and, uh, and, and uh, I am passionate about this. But for now, uh, let me just say this: um, the city is the crossroad of the nations. Um, in 2016, 14.8% of Philadelphia's population was foreign-born. Uh, from 2000 to 2016, the city's foreign-born population grew by roughly 95,000. A, a missional church doesn't see this change as something to be feared. A missional church sees the opportunities to join the mission of God who loves the nations and who invites his people to share in his love for the nations. A, a missional church sees the opportunities for the gospel, the good news that God has made one new humanity out of uh, Jews and Gentiles to to actually be lived out. It sees that opportunity for, for it to be more itself. It sees the opportunity for the church to become uh, that beloved community of all races under the Lordship of Christ. Um, Emil Brunner 
uh, said that the church exists by mission as fire exists by burning. Uh, when, when this, so when the church starts losing touch with its mission, it starts to cease existing. Um, but on the other hand, when the church uh, embraces the mission of God, then it starts to really live. Um, but, and I think um, this is what we are talking about when we say that the church is in need of discipling and disciples led, get led by Jesus into mission. And, uh, um, and uh, I, Eugene Peterson translates uh, John 1.14 uh, and as the word became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood. And I think what he's uh, kind of capturing there is uh, you know, the, the need for the church to be incarnational, um, to, to actually be on the move and, uh, and uh, go into the nooks and crannies of our human society and not flee away from it. Um, the, uh, so I think this ties in to what we were talking about before that the expansive love of God brought the word into our neighborhood where we are. Um, and uh, he didn't flee out from it. He didn't keep himself pure by staying away from it, but the church is also invited to be incarnational as well, to learn what it means. Um, just as Jesus said to his disciples, um, I, I am sending you, as I have also been sent. And I think we are also being invited into this sent uh, journey of uh, being uh, disciples. So, and, and um, you know, and I see Michio in the midst of that. Um, I, I see that Theological education, I see seminary is also being discipled uh, because the church is being discipled, in, is in need of discipling as well. Uh, and the, the ivory tower uh, uh, model of uh, seminary, I think in many ways has contributed to that, that church that's secluding itself from the world. Um, but if we are going to, if a seminary is going to serve a missional church, then we need a seminary that's also a mission. And coming, going to the city where these opportunities for mission abound is where we need to be. And so uh, coming to the city, I think for me, I think it's only the first step. I, I think there's so much more that the Lord uh, needs to do in Philadelphia to show us uh, and to teach us and to shape us. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what that is. Oh, cute. I, I can feel your passion and uh, I, I, I love it. I, you know, it's, it's so important to understand that it's not just how we can benefit the city by going to the city, but we are richly benefited. The, to sit and to listen and to learn from how others see the world and experience the world, that is a refining process for us. And we get to grow in our relationship to the Lord, as well as relationship to our community. Uh, I love this quote, and I think it maybe ultimately comes from David Bosch. I think I, 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 uh, it says that uh, it is not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world, but that God has a church for his mission in the world. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> I think that's, that's a, certainly a helpful thing. Well, uh, we're running out of time here. And I just want to uh, conclude with a final uh, comment or two. Uh, I am persuaded that we are at a critical moment in the history of the church in the United States and in the world. In globalized cities like uh, Philadelphia that are brimming with different cultures, different ethnicities, different religions, our missional theology is more important than ever before. This isn't about a theological debate. It is about the very lifeblood of the church. I'm also persuaded that God has nurtured and blessed Missio Seminary for these last 50 years for this critical moment, and particularly for this city and this region. As I reflect upon my own life journey, on my career, uh, I am so deeply honored and privileged to be at Missio Seminary at this moment. And so we celebrate 50 years of God's blessing uh, on this ministry, this faithful ministry from the beginning to now to the Philadelphia region. And even though we're many of us ensconced in our homes during this COVID 
a pandemic, I am confident that the Holy Spirit will not be quenched, nor will he be quarantined. Well, please check uh, our website for these future webinars that are be coming up. Uh, and I trust you'll gain more insight, more understanding uh, as to what Missio Seminary is. And so with that, I say, God bless. May the Lord keep you and take care of you. Bye-bye.